Right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm Gary Stansberry. Uh, if our speaker uh, can see me, I don't know. Um, our speaker this morning is the Reverend Dr. Dietrich Wise Baker. She is Assistant Professor of Contextual Education and Community Engagement and Director of Contextual Education at Eden Theological Seminary. She has a Master of Divinity degree from Eden Seminary, and she has a Doctorate of Ministry and Preaching degree from Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis. Her subject is how context shapes how we do ministry. I also want to note that originally she had arranged to uh, be here in person, but her three-year-old son has uh, COVID and she is quarantined at home with her son. And that is the reason that she is coming to us via Zoom this morning. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Baker. Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I just realized I did not plug in the external uh, speakers. So the answer is no, but I'm okay. gonna go grab, go, I'm gonna go grab them. Can you hear them close? Can you say something again? And let's see if it's, it's loud enough right now. Yes, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, so you might wanna come a little bit closer. I'm gonna go grab a set of external speakers and I'll be back in a minute, okay? And that'll help too, okay? But go ahead and begin, all right? Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, uh, the baby's fine. He's like most of the small children are. Uh, thank God. Doesn't even seem like he has a cold or anything. So he's he's doing great. <laughs> um, so thank God for that. Um, good to be with you all this morning. Uh, and I thought maybe I'd take a few minutes and uh, say a little bit about my background and how you all know me. Maybe some of you probably remember me, some of you don't, but I've sort of been around for a little while. <laughs> um, uh, so again, Dietrich Wise Baker, I, I know you or the congregation well. Um, I used to be the chaplain, one of the chaplains for Episcopal City Mission, uh, your ministry uh, for uh, youth who are in the juvenile detention center or the uh, the juvenile justice system. Um, I was a chaplain there for 15 years. Um, so I felt like I've been in every Episcopal church in the diocese <laughs> uh, as a chaplain um, at that time and serving to that work. So I've been to the church many times and uh, know the bishop and uh, known the former bishops and uh, the members and the congregations that make up the diocese and uh, continue to thank God for you and uh, you all's ministry. Uh, uh, two things I could talk about, but that I'm not, because I had to pick one. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of hats that I wear. One of them is as the contextual, uh, the professor of contextual education and community engagement at Eden Theological Seminary. So I'm, I'm a seminary professor and, and teach students how to practice ministry, you know, the practice of ministry, reflect upon their ministry, integrate what they're learning in school uh, with how they're going to actually do their work in the world on behalf of, in this case, in some cases, uh, Jesus Christ, um, and how they're going to do that work in the world and to reflect upon that practice um, with their professors and with other peers um, and with the community members and folks like you in churches that they serve or in community organizations where students serve. And so um, I'm responsible for that sort of that whole process at Eden. Um, and the other part of my job at Eden is to help the school um, be deeply engaged in the racial justice movement work um, here in the community, um, and I would say in the world. And so that's sort of my other hat uh, at Eden. So you might hear a little bit of that today. Can you pause just a second? I'm gonna try this out real quick. I was hoping that it would recognize this as being a new set. Don't speak 
Should we speak her out? That should be right. Okay, can you say something again, please? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Much better. Much better? Okay. Yeah. Keep going? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so that's one hat um, and how I've known you all in the past. And then um, a little bit, another hat, but uh, that I will talk mostly about today or spend some time with you reflecting. And I hope Amy will we'll be able to interact and get questions here in a minute because um, I'm not going to talk for 30 minutes. That's excruciating uh, for everybody. Uh, is I'm the lead organizer um, for Metropolitan Congregations United's Break the Pipeline campaign. It's the campaign um, to end the criminalization of Black youth. Um, in the state of Missouri, uh, literally to um, transform uh, schools, uh, policing, and the juvenile courts in the state of Missouri, and um, started that campaign in 2015, and we are continuing to go strong. So um, I'm going to be talking to you mostly about, you know, MCU and its context. Um, and inviting you to think more deeply about engaging with us in our work in the community, but I won't be specifically talking about the Break the Pipeline campaign today. So I am going to stop there for a second, and my child is calling me, um, <laughs> so I just need to check on him in a second. Uh, but what I wanted to ask for an opening question, I'm going to bring up um, some Why did you come to the forum today? Why did you come to the forum today? So. <laughs> right. So think of, say, you know, if a couple of folks have thoughts on that um, about why you came today um, before she comes back. And for those that um, came in a little bit later, her story is that her, her three-year-old son has COVID. So she's quarantined with him right now, which is why she is at home doing this. So it's a little bit of a, you know, extra special <laughs> logistics this morning on this. All right. So did anybody have something that they wanted to share about why they came? Yes, Noreen. Well, I came because it seems like it's been a while since we've done a forum. Um, and I think that's something that I really enjoy doing. Right. So, so I don't, and you probably cannot hear her, right? A little bit. I okay. heard some of it, but not clearly. Yes. So she's just glad to come back into the adult forums and she thought this topic looked interesting. So, okay. Any, anybody else? Similar for me, I generally just come to every adult forum we can get to when Sunday school is going on. And yeah. We can make it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so I want to open up. Um, and take a minute and talk about Jesus's ministry uh, for a second. And my opening question, and I'll show you the slide for this um, in the minute, are when you think of Jesus's ministry in the world, when you think of the patterns of Jesus's ministry, if you, you know, when I look at all the uh, New Testament, I, I actually literally did this. I took the time and I just categorized all the patterns of Jesus that I, I saw in the New Testament. I'm just wondering from you, what kinds of activities did you notice or do you notice that Jesus seems to do over and over again? Like if you were to put like, you know, these are the four or five things that it seems like Jesus was a part of Jesus's ministry or the things that Jesus does over and over and over again. What are some of the things that you would name? <clears throat> Can you guys call some out? Healing. Healing. Absolutely. Sorry. Feeding. 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 Telling parables. Telling parables, stories. Mm -hmm. Seems like he brings people into mm, a different more inclusive, I suppose, but different people like the Samaritans and the mm -hmm. poor and things like that. Yep. So, 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 yeah, basically more inclusive, bringing in Samaritans, others. Tony, I think, also put in the chat to uh, serve the underprivileged. I may have misquoted that, but. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So these, some of these should look familiar, right? All right. So we got healing, the teaching often done um, in parables or stories. 
No one named this one, but this is a very important pattern of Jesus's ministry, casting out demons. <laughs> very important and repetitive part of Jesus's ministry. Someone said feeding or ministering to the poor often was a part. This, these two, I think, are so interesting and so important, I think, these last two, miracles with water. That is a, that is a, a theme that repeats diff, you know, in different ways and different stories, but there's lots of miracles with water. And last but not least, amen, people of resurrection, uh, raising people from the dead. Uh, and so where we, while we may not take all of these literally, right, we are, I think the church and people in different traditions approach these ministries differently, theologically um, and practically in their context of ministry. I think what's, imp uh, what's important to have a conversation about is if we're disciples of Jesus, how are we following the patterns of Jesus's ministry? If we're copying, pasting this at at St. Tim's, um, what, what does that look like? What does our healing ministry look like? What does our teaching ministry look like? What does our casting out demon ministry, right? If, we're, if we don't believe in casting out demons literally, then what is our approximation of that ministry in our time and place in our context in the theology that we believe that God's called us to? What does it look like to feed and minister the poor? I think most churches have this one down. I think most churches got this one. Um, miracles with water. And then raising people from the dead, I, that one always makes me want to shout to think about what, <laughs> what that means in 2022 when there's so much death, there's so much devastation in the community. What could it be? What could, what could be the calling of the church of God of Jesus Christ to raise people from the dead? What does that look like, right? If we, do, if we don't necessarily believe that literally, I know some of us do, um, but if we don't believe that literally, what does it mean to raise people from the dead? And I think we all can look around and see that our community is in need of some form of resurrection power. Can you all see that? That there's so many spaces and places where resurrection power and life is needed in our community and God is calling the church um, to be a vessel and a vehicle, um, to be a part. I don't think we we have the charge to hold it all and do it all, but to be a part of Jesus's ministry of raising people, uh, I would say raising the community from the dead. Um, and so what could what could that look like? And so I'm, I, I, I'm going to keep going, but one of the things I always ask people at this point is to do sort of a quick percentage test. How much of this is done inside of the church? How much of this is done inside of a synagogue or a sanctuary? That's the other thing I was looking for is not only what Jesus did, but where Jesus did it, right? And when I looked at where Jesus did it, I have my percentage. I wanna hear from you, your guess, about how much of this was done in the actual synagogue or sanctuary, you know, in a, in a church building versus how much of this was done out and about in the community amongst the people. If you were guessing, what would be your percentage? Anybody? Almost all. Yeah, kind of was almost all, yeah. Almost all of it was out and about, right? Yeah. Right, I think that's pretty plain if you read the text. The, the text. Now I want to ask ask a challenging question about your church and about churches in general. Mm -hmm. How much of our work is out there versus how much is in the sanctuary or in the synagogue? What would you say that percentage is? Right. So the comment for the front was like 70 or 80 percent is in the church anybody have a different thought on that yeah noreen well i think people are called to recreational without that mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. yeah and Right, so the thought was that before COVID, we had more that was outside the church, but a lot of it's been brought back in because of COVID. <clears throat> so, true. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's true. Um, but I also think even before COVID, I think most of our church's ministry was to the inside the church, not all, but I would, I feel like the majority, I think it ranges for some churches, but I would say 60 at mm -hmm. least in most churches to 
some churches, probably 99%, uh, depending on the church, their activity, their energy, their resources, their focus is to people in the church and to programs around the church. Worship being one of them, right? Studies, programs are mostly focused inside the synagogue, the church. Does that seem fair to people like that? That I'm not making some like wild, you know? There's lots of head nods here. Okay. Lots of head nods. All right. And so I want to stop there and I want to ask you, um, what, what comes up for you when you hear that percentage? What, it, what, it, what comes to your spirit when you hear that percentage? Tony's ready. <laughs> we need to get outside our doors. What did somebody say? I heard someone in the sanctuary say yes. so. Yes, so Mother Liz said we need to get outside our doors. We got to get out of the, We got to get out of this building, don't we? Mm-hmm. And I feel like actually, COVID is a. Per- we are internally focused. Um, uh, Tony says, and I'm assuming you're saying we need to begin to externally focus, Tony, right? And I actually think COVID is is an opportunity to help us to do that a little bit in some ways. To is is a way to make force us sort of outside of our building because in many cases we literally can't be in it. <laughs> Um, we're still struggling to be in our buildings, right? And so um, it is, you know, a gift and a curse, but the gift of it is that there's an invitation to get out into our context of ministry. And I believe for any Christian, the context of, of Christian ministry is actually community. It's actually outside of our building. I don't think most of us think of our ministry that way. When we think of our ministry, we think about our church, our building, right? Not necessarily the context to which God is calling us to, which I don't think is any different than it was in Jesus's day, which is, are those neighborhoods around your church, which are other neighborhoods in our city, our state, our ministry is bigger. I know it's it's not the first time you heard it, but I hope Um, it pushes us a little bit further in our ability to push and to risk, um, to be faithful disciples of Jesus, that we got to get out. We got to get out of these buildings. (laughs) We got to get out of these buildings. Um, So I want to give you a specific specific invitation and some context um, to be able to do that. Is that all right? I have till 1030, right? Yep. Well, we have have a little longer than that. Yeah. So keep going. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to share my screen again um, and uh, ask us. um, Give you an assumption that I have about um, everything that's going on in the community. Because when you move to the community space, I mean, I think we all see there's plenty of problems and things that where God's resurrection power is needed, the healing is needed, the teaching is needed. You see, so when you move into the community, it becomes very obvious, like (laughs) at least what some of our purposes could be in that space, right? There's plenty of things for us to be about in terms of our call um, when we move to the community space. And I believe that all social issues have roots in social, economic, political injustice and inequity in our community. So if someone's poor, I believe it has an injustice and inequity root. Um, If folks are struggling to have housing, I believe that at the root of it, there is some injustice and equity uh, historically or presently or contemporarily. Um, And so I want you to know that is an assumption that I carry when I come to these issues. It's not that I don't think people make personal choices that can affect them adversely, um, but I do not believe that's the root um, of a lot of the issues, the root, I believe, of many of the issues are structural, systemic, and historical um, that have designed our community and our relationships with each other in ways that are unjust and inequitable, um, and that people are best they can living out of that, um, striving to be whole, to be free, um, and to move towards um, just and beloved community. <clears throat> so I want to ask you about what's one problem that keeps you up at night, you know, that's happening in your community, in the, 
I would say our community, we're, we're part of the same community. What's something that really bothers you that you believe as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we should be able to have an impact on? Ellen? The fact that we don't all have access to health care. Lack of health The fact that we don't have access to health care. I could hear her. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. It seems ridiculous in our country anyway, but that yeah. we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Access to healthy food. Mm -hmm. Access to healthy food. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Distribution of resources and education. Yep. Yeah, distribution of resources and education. Mm -hmm. Absolutely changed my life, access to education. I came from a state that was a little bit more equitable and its distribution of educational resources among the poor. Um, I, I grew up in New York. Um, you know, different systems have ways of leveling that better. Um, Missouri's a, quite a struggle in the way that we've set things up and the way that we've drawn lines that pretty much keep the resources, you know, unequal, um, depending on the school district that child goes to greatly affects um, you know, the access opportunity and resources they receive in the district. <clears throat> Others. Think, mm -hmm. So I think affordable housing, right? Even ability to get housing. We've got, you know, there's been folks at our church that have begun doing some work with some homeless programs recently. So, yeah. Affordable housing. It seems like, you know, food, education, health, you know, things that we believe, we believe that everybody should have those. They don't have to all be at the same level. You know, we don't, everybody doesn't have to have a million dollar mansion, but that people should have a safe, clean place to live. They should have healthy food and they should have access um, to an equitable education if they so choose, right? These are things that we feel are across the state, across political lines, believe it or not. <laughs> um, these are things that we generally agree about. Uh, in terms of problems that we want to change. So this is what I always ask communities is how many people feel like they have the, that together as a church, or let's put the whole diocese of Missouri together. Let's all the churches in the Episcopal diocese. Do you, do we, do you feel like you have enough power to actually change? Let's just say, making sure that everybody in the state of Missouri has access to healthcare. Do you feel like you have the power as the diocese uh, of Missouri to make bring that into being? No. Yes there's, or no? What do you think? No. There's heads going this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Right? Just that one, right? I think it's the same if we say the other three, right? We don't have enough power um, currently, I would say, to bring that basic right that we feel all Missourians should have, everybody in the world should have, I think we would say, into being. And so I want to talk a little bit about why, why that is. What's going on? What are the forces that are acting upon us that make it hard for us to achieve the change in the community that we want to achieve? So this is a little diagram that we use when we're training people on, introducing people to this concept. Some of you may have seen it before. And we call it throwing babies in the river. And so what I always ask is if, if there was, you know, if my baby was being thrown in the river, I would pray um, that someone would go after my baby, right? And I, I think most people would. That's our natural response, right? Babies are being thrown in the river. Somebody's going to come and get those babies out right? <clears throat> Absolutely should do that. Please go get my baby, I would always say, right? <laughs> if my baby's being thrown in the river. But what we, what we have to begin to ask when we're beginning to organize in communities is not just, you know, I, I would say the example, now I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> we be, have to begin to ask who is actually putting the babies in the river, right? Because we could spend all of our time and all of our energy and all of our resources getting the baby out of the river, right? But part of what we have to do when we're organizing in community is begin to ask who's putting the baby in the river in the first place, right? And, um, and then the second question I would ask us to think in terms of application is, who are the babies and what is the river of your ministry? Right. 
So this is an example, I think, of a lot of the church's activity. So even when we do venture out, I would say, pass that uh, into the community. I think a lot of our work looks like getting babies out of the river. I think that's the most of our activity is this kind of thing. And so what I'm asking you to do now is tell me what are, what is, what are those ministries? What are, our, what are our getting the babies out of the river ministries in either at, at your church or at other churches that you've seen? I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Right, so we do rice bagging here that goes down to Trinity Food Pantry, right? We right. do, like I mentioned, we've, we've got some people that are going down to the homeless shelter that's down at the uh, UCC church, right? That um, to try to help those folks that come in when it's too uh, cold. Yeah, Tony noticed, you know, mentioned that we've done Siegel tutoring. Uh, we're still doing some, I think, in the virtual sense, uh, which is trying to help out on the education that way. So other things that I didn't mention. Right, we do a lot of collection of foods, um, both on an ongoing basis and then for specific activities, right? We also, you know, uh, gather gifts for uh, Episcopal City Mission and we do, mm -hmm. we used to do the pizza parties uh, at least occasionally mm -hmm. for those, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's all, I, these are all of the getting the babies out of the river. <laughs> right? <laughs> like so you, you see the image I'm trying to paint to you and, and what I'm trying, and please, it's important. Remember I said at the beginning, please get my baby out the river. Right. <laughs> right. I, I totally believe that if the churches didn't step in and do some of these things, that communities um, would hurt more than they're hurting. Right. Like, yeah. We've, there's a question here or a comment. Yeah. yeah. Come on. That's great. The biggest difference that I've experienced coming to this country was that when I came from in Europe, a pregnant woman had the right to doctor's visit monthly. And once the baby was born, mom and child had the right to visit the medical establishment monthly. If we were to do that in this country, we would keep a lot of babies from being thrown in the river because the moms and the babies would be healthy to start with. <clears throat> and, and so there is that structural problem that the medical infrastructure is not geared towards giving that service. Right. And what can we do? Create a hospital? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say that it's not necessarily a lack of resources, right? We have the facilities, we have the infrastructure. I believe we even have the professionals that can provide the care, right? None of those things seem to be the issue with us. I would say the issue rests on our political will, our moral vision and moral imagination of who is supposed to be taken care of and who is not, right? Because I think if, if we look closely, we can see that that happens for some people in our country, right? Um, but those people look a certain way, are at a certain economic level, generally. Um, and that's who we've designated in our moral imagination as worthy of um, the benefits of, of access and privilege. Um, we have not yet in our country, I don't think, adopted a moral vision and imagination that says all people everywhere of all creeds, of all religions, <laughs> of all races deserve certain things. In our country, certain people deserve those things and certain people don't, still. And so I think that's part of it is our political will. Um, and so that I, I wanna hold on to that because I think that's gonna be important in a few minutes in our conversation. <clears throat> but I think you're right, the structures and systems don't support it. I don't think that that doesn't mean it's not available. <clears throat> I, think, I think we got it in the US. We haven't willed ourselves yet um, to share it equitably and justly. <clears throat> And there's some barriers against us doing that.
um, for a long time. So I want to show you. Um, I want to show you some some slides. I think real quick. It's going to go fast, okay? <laughs> so I think I'm supposed to end at ten thirty. Um, and so I want to show you what I call the justice buffet. This is something that I created to help me think about how I see churches doing ministry. And we've already talked about it, but I believe most churches do what we would consider charity, which is pulling the babies out of the bathwater, right? <clears throat> Needs to be done. But at some point we have to look upstream and ask who's putting the babies in and why are the babies coming down and begin to work and solve and organize to change the root issue, right? So that basically no more babies are actually even being put in the river. Does that make sense? That that's ultimately where we want to go. But most churches don't work on that problem, right? Most churches don't spend their energy resources and time there. Today is an invitation to you through an organization in your community to consider joining other churches to work upstream. And that doesn't mean stop charity, but to begin to move towards working towards justice. <clears throat> um, so that's that's sort of one buffet. And, and in order to do that, we have to do some educational people. People have to understand why. People have to understand structures and systems. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is to stop the babies from coming out down the bath down the river in the first place. And that that would be justice. Another buffet for those of us who are sort of more into the movement are things like activism and protesting advocacy work, some organizations and folks get involved and in. I know some Episcopal churches have been involved in those things before. But activism generally is a reaction to our values being violated. It does not necessarily move us to stopping the babies from being thrown into the river either. So that's an important thing to watch. You might be talking about those structures and systems, calling those structures and systems and out. That does not, doing that does not necessarily dismantle those structures and systems either. Right. So I can tell you, we protested for over a year during the Ferguson protests. Right. And some things changed. Right. And there's a whole bunch of things that still need to change because they don't get changed from just the protesting. Something has to follow that. Advocacy work is generally when we depend upon a power entity outside of ourselves to be benevolent, you know, to go to our lawmaker or to our mayor or to our school officials, those who have power and ask them to align themselves with the vision of the community. Sometimes that happens, people are with us, you know what I mean? And it's easy to get things done when people are with us. But as you all very well know that people aren't always aligned with sort of the community values of justice. And so you can advocate all day long, you don't have enough power to <laughs> make sure people get health care in their state, <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely not in this one. We've been fighting uh, to, to get closer to that goal for a long time and have been fought tooth and nail in this particular state in Missouri, okay? Just getting Medicaid expanded, for example. Um, so advocacy works to a degree. But the thing that really works is when people of like heart and like mind, including people of faith, decide, you know what, enough is enough. No more babies in the river. We're going to band together. We're going to build enough power so that you don't get to dictate to us what's just and what's equitable. We get to create the moral imagination and vision for our community, and we have enough power and resources to implement it. That's called organizing. And that's what I want to invite you all into today, really briefly. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend any time on this. I just want you to see it. Um, that I do believe racism is the main barrier to our moral imagination for equity and justice in our country. Um, I believe it is the thing that definitely has to be dealt with in order for us to arrive at beloved community. Um, for those of you who are into theories of change, you know, I'll share these slides later. This is the theory of change in our community. Um, we believe that we actually, through campaigns and different issues like healthcare or housing, have the ability to actually demonstrate our power, build our power. Um, 
that's that's one piece of how we believe we can change things, how we can get those babies out of the bathwater. The second way is to build our base. More and more congregations join us. More and more people who are impacted by the issues join us. And together we build enough power, resources, and partners that our power is absolutely undeniable. I mean, people, you know, one of the things about the last political election, you know, how much money is generated in these elections, you all? It's, ri it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but people understand, you know, inherently sort of the power grab that's happening, right? And how much money and resources, you know, go into those campaigns, right? And into that system. I'm just saying it's a sign to you that power is afoot, right? When you're seeing that amount of money, resources, time, and energy directed at something. What if we continue to grow and build that for our community visions, for our moral vision of a just and beloved world. That's what organizations like MCU and Gmail are doing it. And we know ultimately that we have to tell a new story about what's possible, that we have to dream that new imagination. And the church is awesome. At, it got, has some, some vision for that, have, has some ways of talking about that, that I think will be hopeful um, to the whole world. Um, so, um, so this is just, um, MCU is a member of the National Gamel Network. This is an affiliate here in St. Louis um, that I want to invite you all to consider joining other churches, the Episcopal, other Episcopal churches who are a part of us. Um, in fact, um, John Stratton, one of your own, is one of the leaders in our clergy caucus and is actually beginning to form clusters of churches um, in different areas. And there is a West County cluster forming of churches. And I want to invite you all to be prayerful and consider joining that cluster of churches um, to deepen your work um, to get the baby out of um, the bathwater. What are we focusing on in 2022? We're working on getting lead out of schools this year. We're working on illegal dumping through local ordinance of allocation of budget funds. You know, we spent the last year in Jennings um, in North County, and there's a lot of illegal dumping, as you, you all probably could imagine, in the community that people are concerned at. We work with formerly incarcerated people and youth who've been formerly incarcerated, and we're working on automated expansion, restoring voting rights, as you've heard, these campaigns all across the country uh, to get returning citizens um, their full rights to participate um, in uh, the community, uh, protecting the air that we share. We're installing um, air monitors um, uh, to begin to measure and understand what's happening in the air in Missouri um, so that we can have the data to fight. Um, we're opposing suppression and tooth telling in our schools. You know, there's um, a lot of bills going forth around um, not teaching the history of racism in the United States and around the world. And those bills are up in, in our state. Um, and all that work that we did around expanding Medicaid and the petition initiative process that allows us to be able to fight in our state, our state sees that we're growing power to be able to use that process to change. And so they're now they're coming to dismantle that process to take away the power that we've grown to use to get stuff done in our state. And so we got to protect our ability to continue to grow power in our petition initiative process. Um, so those are just some of the things that we're working on. What can you expect if you became a member of MCU? You get a professionally trained organizer like myself. Um, you have leadership training opportunities that you can participate here or statewide. You can build relationships and power with other faith-based um, um, institutions, including churches. Um, and this is a place for you to engage and own all right, we're building enough power to change these things. We're tired of just taking babies out the bathwater. We're going to do that. But we are now joining a larger strategy to make a change on these issues. And we know we have to dismantle structural racism in order to do it, which I believe is on the hearts and the minds of many. Um, I'm not going to go over this. This is just if you if you join, these are some of the things that we ask you to do. <clears throat> and I'm going to kind of stop there and just ask some of these some of some of these questions. You know, um, so let me stop sharing. 
I know that was a lot. That was really fast. <laughs> but I just want to ask you all, what do you think? You know, what is sticking out to you in terms of our conversation so far today that you feel is in line with what your church is trying to do in yeah. the world and in your community? I have a very basic question to make sure. She said it at the beginning, but what does MCU stand for? MCU stands for Metropolitan Congregations United. You got it. So it's a combine it's a combination of churches in the region that are are engaged in this work. Yep. She got it. Yep. Yeah. So so there's been some members of our church that have been you know at least gone to some of the meetings and things like that, but we have not found a way to kind of engage. So I appreciate the invitation here. And I'll also ask you to actually uh, send me the contact information for the person that's um, setting up the regional churches here in the West County area. That would be great because I'd like to reach It's out. John. You guys know John. John Stratton. I, I don't know him. Oh, you don't know there. John? Okay, yeah. He's, the rector. He's, he's, he's a rector at, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, yeah, he's a rector in uh, Central West End. What's the name of the Trin church though? Trinity, Trinity Central West End, he's rector. Okay. 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 And I, I just assume met, all Episcopalians know each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, and since we brought up John, may, may I verbalize sure. a question? Sure. Um, and you can repeat it to the audience. Um, I, I'm just delighted. Uh, and I'm not surprised that Reverend John is doing this. Mm -hmm. He's in that pyramid of activism, advocacy, and organizing in a big way. Um, the Episcopal Church under Bishop Dion is organizing a strategic vision, which is amazingly powerful and rich in great context. I, 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 I'm always wondering, we have, so we have Reverend John doing this and setting up organizations. I haven't seen that in that strategic. I mean, you talk about our church, we, we have this Episcopal church, but we, we seem to diverge and not converge. And for me, that's not strategic. Mm -hmm. An important aspect of strategy is selectivity. And I'm I'm excited about what I hear Reverend Stratton doing. And I'm also- Wondering how that's connected to the strategic vision that the Bishop is laying yeah, out. Yeah, a little, a little confused. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I, that's not a question, that's just a- Yeah, question. yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I, well, this is what I would say. I mean, I don't think all of these things are perfectly neat, but what I do know is that they have relationship and that they do know what the other is doing. Do you know what I'm saying? I know that John is a part of you know, as an Episcopal member and a rector, he's a part of those conversations and um, the strategic okay. vision. It may simply be that MCU is a way, I'm sure it's not the way or the only way um, that the strategic yeah. vision will be implemented, but it definitely is a lane for some churches um, to engage if the issues that we're working on align with, you know, what the church is um, want to work on. And I think in general, even if it's not an issue we're working on, if the set of relationships um, is important enough to engage in that we might build power together to work on anything, because to really get any of the stuff done that we want to get done, it's going to take a conglomeration of us mm -hmm. um, in relationship um, that we can activate and move um, when we need to around certain things. Um, and so MCU at least provides a space for that kind of infrastructure for churches. Um, I don't, you know, I'm sure the diocese probably has its own version of that, you know, maybe, um, maybe the Episcopal church at RIT has a version of that, um, that can activate Episcopal churches to engage mm -hmm. in acts of justice. Um, I know our denomination is, it's, 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 it's not that strong. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. I don't know about others, but ours is, you know, there's something, but it's not strong. And so organizations like MCU and the Gamal Network are places that we can kind of link up together and be focused and sort of razor pointed towards huh. different sure. pieces. Yeah, I agree. Uh, 
No, I'm just going to say, I am very sorry. It is 1040 now, so we do need to oh. wrap up so that we can uh, have folks go to the service. So I'm going to flip the, the, the camera here this way so that she can see all of you in here. So you can say, thank you, wave. Yeah, there we go. And thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for being with us today. Uh, we do hope your son it makes a quick recovery. Probably you hope so too, so you can get him back out of the house with his energy and things like that. And um, But best wishes, wishes to you, so with that as well. Yes, I will send this slide to you, Amy. And if, um, if the, folks can reach out to me if they want to follow up and I'll make sure you get connected. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you so much. All right. You Thank all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Reverend Dietrich. Thank you. So good to see you again. You too. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Huh?